All right, so as Clay mentioned today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about how to use social media to promote your virtual event. Um, and as Clay mentioned, I'm Erica Linguanti. I am the Director of Marketing at Achieve. Um, we're a digital agency specializing in nonprofits. So we do digital marketing and social media campaigns on my end of the house. And then we also have a really great team that does some really amazing web design and web support. Um, so if you need help with any of those things, definitely let us know. Um, but today, and I'm sure you're all very familiar if you've been working on social media efforts for your nonprofit, whether it's to raise awareness or fundraise or promote events, um, social media is super noisy and it's always filled with competing messages that has not changed. Um, and certainly with a lot of nonprofits switching to virtual events, there's going to be a lot of competition for that as well. So definitely noisy. We want to kind of break out of the crowd. So let's talk about ways to kind of make you stand out and, and make sure that the right people are seeing your messaging and learning about your event um, and helping to support your organization. So today we're going to review some social media setup tasks you should have completed if you joined me last week. Um, we kind of talked about kind of some of the basics to get you set up with social. Um, so we'll kind of review that in case you missed me or maybe you didn't get to the homework yet. I'm also going to talk about some Facebook event best practices. Facebook has made some updates recently, so we'll get to kind of review some different options that are available to you. I'm going to talk about some free social tactics that can help raise awareness for your virtual events, but then I'm also going to dive into some paid social advertising techniques that might help with driving registrations for you. Um, as Clay mentioned, definitely feel free to chat me questions. Um, we'll make sure to have plenty of time at the end, but also throughout, you know, if something's really urgent, definitely send me a chat and we'll try to find an answer for you. And if I don't know, not ashamed to tell you, and hopefully I can point you in the right direction of someone who might. So first thing first, let's make sure you're set up for success with social. So if you joined me last week, you probably heard me talk about these pixels. You see, this is a small piece of code that goes on your website. Um, it's really good at, with, on the advertising side, there's a lot that you can do to kind of drive traffic back to your website based on people that have been there or lookalike audiences. Um, but it's also really good just for tracking in general, whether you're doing advertising or not. So as a bare minimum, you should definitely have a Facebook pixel on your website if you don't. Um, I included the URL on this slide and I will be sending out the slides so that way you can go through and learn more about pixel installations if you aren't familiar with it. Um, also, if you're not sure if you have a Facebook Pixel on your website, there's a free Chrome extension that might help you. It's called Facebook Pixel Helper, really easy to install. Um, and that lets you look on any web page and see if there's a Facebook Pixel firing or not. So if you're not sure if your website has a Facebook Pixel already, download that uh, Chrome extension, take a look, see what's going on. And if you do have a Pixel, then try to figure out uh, who created it in your organization and if you have access to it. Um, if not, then you know you need to install one. Um, and then just kind of another call out. I know today we're going to talk specifically about social media, but just in general digital marketing, you really, really, really should be tracking where your traffic is coming from. Um, it, it's really helpful to know what's working and what isn't. If you're spending a bunch of time on Twitter, but you're not getting much web traffic from there, that's important to know. Um, if you're spending a ton of time on email and you're not getting many results from that, it's important to know. Um, so using things like the Facebook Pixel and Google Analytics to kind of look at what's going on on your website and where your traffic's coming from is great. Um, but also you can take that a step further. So Google Tag Manager or tracking links, you know, if you're using Google URL Campaign Builder or Bitly, um, different things that are going to let you see where your traffic's coming from is really going to help you figure out where you should be placing your efforts. Um, so even for this, for your events, if you're using social, you know, definitely go in and, and make some Google URL campaign builders so you know, you know, which links are coming from Facebook and which ones are coming from Twitter and which ones coming from LinkedIn. Um, and you can even double dip. I often do, you know, I create the tracking link with Google URL campaign builder and then I go ahead and I use Bitly to shorten it and kind of give it a nice vanity URL that's short and simple that people are going to remember and it's easier for them to type in. So you can double that too. So just wanted to kind of call that out before we go any further. Um, another thing we talked about, if you were with me last week, was Facebook giving tools. So we've all seen the birthday fundraisers and things. So you would need a Facebook donation account for those. You can also add a donate button to your page. You can add them to your posts. So that could be really handy if you are doing some social media posts leading up to your event. You know, you can certainly do posts saying, you know, oh, if you can't attend, you know, would you consider making a, a financial donation? Um, and you can include that donate button right on the post for people, make it simple for them to give. 
Um, you can also raise funds through live streams. So that's an option if, if that's going to be your method. If you're going to do a Facebook live stream or an Instagram live stream, you can raise funds through that live stream itself right on Facebook or Instagram. So that's an option. In order to take advantage of this stuff, you do need to have a Facebook donation account. They've simplified that process. It used to be kind of a three-step process. Now you just kind of go straight to this website um, and create a payout account. Uh, there's two different ways to do it. You can do it with your organization's baking information. That would be my recommendation. That's going to get you payouts faster from Facebook. It's also going to give you more tools that you can use within Facebook for donations. Um, the other option would be you could do the payouts through Network for Good, and I think they pay those every 45 days. But if you go to the website listed, it'll give you the details on that. But if you don't have a Facebook donation account yet, I would definitely recommend creating one with your organization's banking information. Um, once you have your Facebook donation account set up, you can also take advantage of Instagram giving tools because remember they are sister companies. So a lot of the back end is sort of one and the same, especially on advertising. You know, if you're running Instagram ads, you're doing it from Facebook ads manager. So uh, for Instagram giving tools, a couple different options there. You can put donate stickers on your stories or other people can put the donate button on stories for you. So that's really good, especially if you have um, you know, dedicated volunteers or your board really likes using Instagram, that's a great place to ask them to try to promote and fundraise for you. You can also add a donate button to your profile, and then you can also live stream on Instagram as well. Um, again, I've written some blogs about this in the past, so I've included the links there that kind of give you more step-by-step -step instructions. Um, so you can kind of take a look there if, if you don't have that set up and you want to take advantage. Uh, last kind of be last piece of homework from my session last week, in case you missed it, is an online giving checklist. And again, I know today we're really hyper focusing on social media, uh, but social media is really just one tool in your toolbox when it comes to digital marketing. So it kind of all works together, multi-channel. So if you want to kind of take inventory of your website and, and your fundraising efforts and see if you're set up, that, we've got a great checklist on our website for free. So feel free to download that and, and take inventory. So moving right along for today, we're going to talk about, first thing I want to talk about is some Facebook event best practices. So we've all probably seen new Facebook. Uh, there's, they've changed some of their functionalities, but they've also added some features. So I did want to kind of talk about some of the options. When you're going to create your Facebook event, Facebook's going to ask you whether it's online or in person. Um, if you're doing a virtual event, I would recommend checking the online option, but um, you know, you could also do in person and, and edit it later. You can always change your mind, so don't over rotate on that. But in theory, if you're doing a virtual event, definitely check online. Um, if you click online, step two, it's going to give you a couple different options of how guests will join. So you can do, you know, if you're going to do a Facebook Live within your Facebook event um, for your virtual event, you can select that option. I did want to call out a new feature that they have now as well called Messenger Rooms. You can video chat with up to 50 guests. It's totally free and there's no time limit. It's a newer thing that Facebook has rolled out. So depending on what you're doing, that might make sense. Um, you know, certainly you can use Zoom or other things as well, but just kind of an extra feature that's available to you. Um, another option is you can also just add your own link. So whether that's a registration link or you're going to have your virtual event hosted on a special landing page or website that you're creating. Um, you know, if you're going to kind of do something outside of Facebook, I would just use your own link and include that there. Uh, bonus points for tracking links. You know, use your bit.ly, use your UTM codes, right? From there, step three, it's gonna ask for details. So this is pretty straightforward, things like your event name, your date and time, still ask for location, and I get questions from some of our clients about this a lot. The reason why is they're trying, Facebook's trying to figure out what time zone this is in and also to help people near you find your event. So still put in your location, you know, if, if you, want people in the local area to be able to find you easier. Um, for your description, definitely make sure to put all the details here. Um, don't forget to tag your sponsors and your community partners in this. Um, also too, you know, try not to just do blanket, you know, paragraph after paragraph after paragraph. Think about the behavior that people have when they're on social media. A lot of times they're skimming. You know, you're not sitting there much like a web page or an email. You're probably not reading every single little thing. You're skimming and seeing if you're interested in something. So make it very easy um, to break up that text. So, you know, bonus points. You can use emojis to kind of draw attention if you want someone to register now, right? Draw a little bit of attention, break up the text. Um, 
you know, make sure you're really detailed too. You want it to be clear. If someone is interested in your event, you don't want them to walk away confused of, wait, what do I have to do to join? Um, and then also don't forget to pick a category. I see people skip this all the time. Categories are great because it's going to suggest your event to other people that have shown interest in other events similar to yours on Facebook. So, you know, if you're a cause, check their category box. Another newer feature from Facebook that I do want to call out is they are offering a paid access option. Um, not everyone is eligible, so I did include a link for you to go and check your own eligibility. Um, but this is a way where people can actually pay for your event um, and get access right through Facebook. Um, and they're being pretty generous. They're going to give you 100% of the revenues through the end of the year um, so after applicable taxes. So no processing fees on that. So that's a nice way to charge for your event. If you're eligible and you don't have, you know, a good system already in place and you're trying to throw a virtual event together and you do want to charge an access fee, uh, that could be an option for you. So that is available. Um, when the last kind of thing I did want to call out, kind of your final step, you can upload your cover photo. I see a lot of times with cover photos that it's the wrong size and things are chopped off. The Facebook recommended size I included on here, it's that 1200 by 628 pixels, sort of the recommended sizing. So when you're, you're coming up with your cover, that's kind of how I would crop it. Um, another thing I want to call out too is your event settings. I see people skip this step a lot. You can control things like, you know, do you want your guest list to be public or not? Do you only want admins to be able to post in the event or can anybody post? Um, if anybody can post, do you want to have um, your host or a co-host approve the post before they show up in your event or are you okay with it being a free for all? Um, also, are you going to have someone on your team that's actively responding to Facebook messages? If so, you can check the box and let people send you, ask you questions through Facebook Messenger, or you can disable that. So it just kind of depends on what you're going to do. Also, your settings is where you can add co-hosts. So this is another big missed opportunity I see a lot. If you have some really great sponsors or community partners that are coming in on events for you, if you make them a co-host of your event, your event's also going to show up on their page. Um, and they'll have some access to it. So that can kind of help encourage people to share it a little bit more and just kind of expand your reach. So that's another option as well. I know all of this is pretty straightforward if you've created a Facebook event before, but did want to kind of review some of these newer options that are available to you. Um, this is also a really great example from our friends over at the Legal Aid Society of Palm Beach County. Uh, they just had a really great event on Saturday that I attended. It was virtual, and I got some of my Christmas shopping done because they had a great virtual auction. Uh, so that was fun. Um, but they had a lot of details that they needed to include in their description on their Facebook event, as you can see. But it's not just two or three big, giant paragraphs. They really broke it up. They put, you know, different emojis to kind of pull in your attention to different sections. They've got clickable links in there since there was a silent auction component, you know, different ways to register for that. Um, they also were doing some YouTube options in addition to Facebook. So you had the option flexibility of where you want to stream. So they made that really, really easy to find. And what I really loved is they also went through and they tagged all of their sponsors right in the actual post. I see that step skipped a lot, but I'm sure your sponsors would probably really appreciate that. So I thought that was a really great job. Another call out was their cover photo. I see a lot of times with cover images for events that they're really, really, really text heavy. It's got all the details for the event and it's almost like a flyer. Um, I would encourage you not to do that because again, think about how you're probably looking for a Facebook event. You're probably on your phone, you're probably late at night. You're probably not gonna be able to read all those tiny details crammed into that Facebook cover. And truthfully, if you are interested in the event, you're going to click on it. You're going to want to read the description of the event anyway. So you don't need everything on your cover image. Sometimes even just a regular plain photo, stock photo, or a photo your organization has is better than trying to come up with some crazy flyer. Um, so what I liked about this, it was just the name of the event, had some really great graphic work on there, um, but it wasn't too cluttered. They weren't trying to add all the details about, you know, text to register for the auction and go here and go there. And this time they left all that out. It's in the description. You don't need it in your cover, I promise. Um, so this is a really good example, just to kind of give you an idea, especially if you are really detail heavy in terms of different steps to participate in the event like Legal Aid was. Um, any questions on this before I keep moving forward, Clay? Oops.
Um, no, sorry, sorry, like sorry about that. You're all good. <laughs> I couldn't find my mute okay. button. <laughs> oh, no worries. <laughs> Gonna assume now, so I'll keep moving forward. Um, so now that we've talked a little bit about just kind of getting your Facebook event set up, if that's something that you want to do, um, I want to talk a little bit about some free tactics to raise awareness for your virtual event using social media. So the really obvious answer is share engaging content. And at this point, everyone's like, all right, great, Erica, but how do we do that? <laughs> um, and this is going to look different for everyone. A lot of it's going to depend on your organization and your followers and your supporters. Um, but really, in general, step one, when you're coming up with any type of Facebook content, whether it's an ad, a post, a video, et cetera, a story, um, who are you talking to and why? You know, do those people already understand what you do? Do they already support your mission? Um, if so, great. If not, you know, maybe you need to do a little bit of explaining and educating there. Um, and especially if you're promoting the event, one thing that I'm really seeing missing the mark for a lot of organizations right now is they're taking the approach of themselves of, you know, this is what we're doing and, you know, will you help us? And this is why we need the help instead of telling people why they should give up their Thursday night that they were planning to scroll through Netflix and maybe drink a glass of wine. You know, why should they come to your virtual event instead? Um, what's in it for them? So really highlighting that versus coming from the place of, you know, our mission is blah, blah, blah. Um, really trying to make it about who you're trying to get to attend your event and why they should attend. Um, also kind of other ways to kind of engage your audience, you know, are you repurposing content? You know, have other, you know, community partners and sponsors been sharing content about your event and helping to promote you. You can certainly repurpose that and share it yourself. Um, user generated content. I know everything's going virtual this year, but it's very possible that some of your past events, you have really great photos um, that people have tagged you in from different galas. Those make great throwback Thursday posts, right? You can reshare it and give photo credit tagging the person that had tagged you last year at your event. Um, you know, do a th throwback Thursday, you know, to when it was in person, and then you can shout out how it's virtual this year and, and how people can part still participate. Um, so that's kind of a fun, engaging option. You know, so don't forget to cross promote, you know, tag your sponsors, you know, make your partners your co-hosts, right? Um, if you're cross promoting, other people are going to be more likely to share things on your behalf as well. And then if you are making an ask, make it really clear. Um, you know, if someone needs to click a link and register, you should make that really clear that register now. Here's the URL. Um, you know, if you want them to RSVP to your Facebook event, share the Facebook event and tell people, don't forget to RSVP below. Um, just be really, really clear about what action you want them to take sometimes. And, and try not to make too many asks in the same post or in the same ad. Um, people are really probably not going to do all of them. So what's your one thing you need someone to do after they see whatever content you're delivering to them? And again, just really, really important for engaging content. Make your messaging about them not about you. I know that that's counterintuitive, um, but think about your own behavior when you're on social media and, and you're looking at different ads for e-commerce shopping or, you know, different events that you want to attend, right? Well, what lens are you approaching that from? You're thinking, what's in it for me? Do I want those cute new shoes? Do I want to take time out of my Saturday to go to that drive through you know, Halloween event? You know, what do you want to do? Um, make your messaging about them really, really important. Um, another quick call out that I see, you know, really big missed opportunity, video content is your friend. There have been a lot of studies on this across all social media channels. Video content very often drives way more engagement than any other content type, but this is especially, especially, especially true on Facebook. The algorithm really, really favors video. Um, so video is your friend and it doesn't have to be a super high production value. It can be, you know, quick little clips that you've made, um, even Canva now has some free options for adding animation to your static images. So that's going to register as a video on Facebook, right? A um, lot of different workarounds to get some video content into your feed. Um, another thing I did want to call out that a lot of people don't realize that you can do. If you joined me last week, you heard me talk about pre-scheduling content and how Facebook Creator Studios is a really great free option for scheduling content on Facebook and Instagram. But even better, you can actually A-B test a video post to see which one your followers like more, um, which is really awesome. So if you go to Creator Studios, I kind of did a screenshot over here 
of what that looks like in Creator Studio is when you go to create a post, this section option, create post test, and then it's going to kind of open up to an interface, just like you would for scheduling any type of video post with Facebook Creator Studios. But the benefit is you can do a two to four video posts, test them against each other. So Facebook's going to serve those posts to your followers for 24 hours and see which one is getting the most engagement. Whichever one does get the most engagement is the one that's going to get posted to your feed after 24 hours. So that's a nice way to test out your content and see what's working if you are going to leverage video. So that's another way to kind of get a little bit more engagement if you're a little bit stuck and people don't seem to be responding. Test and A-B test. Um, if you haven't done this, you're not familiar with this, you're not familiar with Creator Studios, again, I included a link to some support information at the bottom. You'll be getting the slides so you can reference this back. You can learn a little bit more about how to actually set that up and do a video post test. Um, another way you can kind of get some engagement is taking advantage of stories. And I see a lot of huge missed opportunities here because people think stories need to take a ton of time and, you know, they want to make these really beautiful graphics and, and little video clips. And that's amazing. If you have the time and the resources, go for it. Um, but it doesn't always have to be that way. Here's a really great example from a virtual event that later this month that I am stoked for. I bought my tickets. I'm going. Um, <laughs> New York Restoration Project. It was started by Beth Midler. So every year they do a big Hocus Pocus themed gala up in New York. But this year with COVID, they're doing it virtually. Um, and they've been doing a really great job with stories by just in really simple ways. So kind of this first one, Beth Midler had shared a post and then New York Restoration Project, they just shared her post, right? Um, and this could work even for your own stuff. You don't have to be a celebrity. If you post a new post on your Instagram feed, go ahead and share it to your stories with a new post alert caption. Or um, sometimes I see influencers that'll kind of scribble over the image. You can't quite see what it is. And then they'll put like a new new post alert. Go check it out. Um, that's a really easy way. Or if other people are posting on your behalf, go ahead and share it again. Um, make it easy. Another option that I've seen them do a lot lately is um, taking content from other platforms. So a screenshot of a tweet that went out and then just adding some of those cute little stickers on top and boom, you have an Instagram and Facebook story um, and you didn't have to spend hours and hours coming up with something beautiful. Um, and it still gets the message across. So another great idea. Um, I also did want to call out if your organization, if you're crushing it on Instagram and you have over 10,000 followers, you can do swipe up in your story. So you can actually have a URL linked to your story and people can swipe right up to whatever landing page you want. So it's a great way to drive them to ticket sales if you have that feature. If you don't, that is okay. Um, you can always just do hashtag link in bio and make sure that your Instagram bio does link to your event registration page. These are kind of some ways that won't take you a ton of time to take advantage of stories. Um, and I would say too, you know, I see with organic content, you know, people try to post, you know, every day or multiple times a day, getting close to, you know, a big activation or fundraising effort. And that can sometimes get a bit much for your followers. Stories, on the other hand, that's something that you can do all day, every day, if you have the time and resources. Um, it keeps you top of mind, especially on Facebook and Instagram, because you're going to be suggested to people right up top as they're scrolling through. Um, that's a really easy way, you know, here's some examples of, you know, it doesn't have to be some super elaborate um, graphic or, or video clip to get some attention. And then kind of finally, when we're talking about free tactics, never, never, never underestimate the power of a share. Um, you know, Facebook algorithm specifically, but also, you know, Instagram, Twitter, all of them, the algorithms have changed a lot over the years. It's harder to get reach for free. Um, but if you have people that are regularly commenting, liking, saving, sharing your content, the algorithm is going to register that, oh, this is more engaging. People want to see this. I need to show this to more people. So it's going to organically open up your reach for free. So first step, you know, can you rally your team? Um, you know, can you get your, your staff and team members or you know, your board or maybe some of your volunteers? Can you get them to share posts about your event? Um, you know, maybe it's saying, hey, you know, we just posted today, would you mind going and sharing that? Or, you know, if your your team is a little bit hesitant or they need a little bit more hand-holding, you know, especially with boards, sometimes we'll create media kits. So you'll give them recommended copy and assets, whether it's a video or a photo or a little graphic you made, asking them to share 
uh, to, to get some attention, or if you just want them to share content that you know is going to be posted, you know, maybe your media kit is just more of a tutorial. So you have a screenshot of what the post is going to look like that they need to share. Um, you know, tell them when that's scheduled to be posted so they know, okay, on Saturday, I need to go share this video post. Uh, make it really easy for them to help you. Um, if it, the harder it is for them to help, the less likely they are to do it. So really clear instructions can help if you've got a hesitant team. Um, another option too, you know, would your sponsors and community partners be willing to share tagged content promoting the event? Um, my guess would be yes, especially your sponsors. If they are paying to get their name out there, they want to be tagged in your content and they want to brag about the fact that they are sponsoring your, your event. So definitely leverage them as well. But also you can ask your supporters. Um, you know, in your email marketing, you know, can you ask people to RSVP to your Facebook event or maybe share a video that you posted that you're linking to? You know, maybe that's your call to action in, in your monthly newsletter uh, just to try to get some organic traffic. Um, another option, too, is after people register for your event, if you're doing it on your website, can you have a pop-up or a thank you page or even a thank you email or all three that's saying, hey, great, thank you so much. You know, don't forget to RSVP to our Facebook event and you're driving them to go do one more thing for you to try to get a little bit more attention. So if they RSVP for that Facebook event, now their friends can see that they have RSVP'd and then you, you're gonna expand your reach that way. Um, or again, maybe you're just asking them to share a post about the event. You know, maybe it's a little video that you've created um, or a graphic, you know, to kind of spread the word, let people know that they're going and, and get the word out. So never underestimate the power of a share here. Um, but before I kind of keep going, do we have any questions that came in? Yeah, there's a good question here. So um, if you have a fundraiser event flyer, how do you make it about them and not the organization? Can you provide examples? Right. So today we're talking specifically about your messaging on social media. Um, for your event flyer, you know, that's going to be a little bit more direct. You're, you're giving people details about the event and the information for how they can join. But again, you know, when, with your fundraising event flyer, that's probably not going to focus so much on your mission as much or what you do. You might have a little call out to that, um, but really you're going to want to highlight, you know, what's in it for them. So, for example, with Legal Aid, they were auctioning off a Peloton bike. They had some live music going on, they had a silent auction, they had a raffle, you know, all of those things are things that are kind of fun and engaging that people may want to participate in. Um, so that's definitely good. And then, you know, the, regarding, I see there's a question about, you know, Zoom links for that flyer as well, you know, definitely, definitely make it easy for them. So that's why I recommended Bitly. Um, with Bitly, you can actually create vanity URLs. So it'll just be bit.ly backslash, you know, my event, <laughs> or whatever you want to call it. Um, so I, for your, especially on your flyers, I would definitely put a shortened vanity bit.ly um, on there for access versus including your giant Zoom link. Um, that's going to be a bit much. Or even better, drive them to a landing page on your website that has all of the details for the event on the flyer and same thing, you can just do a shortened bit.ly or if you have a really clean short URL on your website, that works as well. Okay, super. That's cool. the only question so far. Oh, I see one more, is bit.ly free yep. to use? Yes, bit.ly is free to use. They do have some paid options that have some extra features, um, but yeah, Bitly is totally free and you can even do the vanity URLs with that. Um, so definitely take advantage. And also too, again, you can double dip. So I always like to do Google URL campaign builder because that's gonna let me enter in into the URL, you know, that this is from Facebook, from my Facebook event, for this campaign, you know, I can add all my tags to that. So I, when I'm looking on my Google Analytics, I know where traffic came from. But then you can take that long tracking link and toss it into Bitly and come up with that nice, pretty short link. But it's still going to have all that code um, and the tags on the back end of that URL. So totally OK to double dip as well. Any other questions before we keep moving, Clay? Uh, I think we're good for now. All right. So next, we're going to talk about some techniques to leverage paid social advertising. So if you're with me last week, 
you probably heard me talk about this a little bit. Um, and, I'm, and for the SS section, I'm talking specifically about Facebook and Instagram, not because you can't advertise on the other platforms, certainly, you know, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, LinkedIn, all of those you can advertise on, and I absolutely do. However, if you're new to social advertising or your budget's really limited, I see time and time again that Facebook and Instagram advertising is usually going to be your best ROI. Um, you've got more people on the platform, and they have really sophisticated targeting options, so you can get really specific about who you're reaching. Um, so that's kind of why I'm going to hyper focus on, on Facebook and Instagram for today. Um, but I did want to call out, you know, if you're seeing that your engagement on Facebook and Instagram is lower, especially on Facebook, I did want to call out that the algorithms changed a lot in the past year. You know, now only about one to three percent of your followers even see your organic content in their feed. So by placing ad spend strategically behind important posts or creating your own ads to run, um, you know, driving traffic to your website or to a registration page, um, that's probably going to be really impactful for you and, and really expand your reach quickly without having to rely on, you know, kind of being at the mercy of people. Are they going to engage with your content? Are they going to share it? Are they going to save it? All of that. Um, in terms of budget, I get asked this a lot for Facebook. Their recommendation is at least $5 per day minimum per campaign. Obviously, more is more, um, but you, and you don't want to spread yourself too thin. So if you are spending less than that per day on your campaign, you're definitely wanting to reconsider your budget there. Um, and there's tons and tons of different placements. So we've got the two different platforms you can advertise on, Facebook and Instagram. You've got hundreds of targeting categories, dozens of ad types, lots of different placements. Um, it, it can get really creative <laughs> with how you want to slice and dice these. Um, and if this is super new to you, I definitely encourage you to check out Facebook um, Blueprint. They have tons and tons and tons of free courses that will teach you literally anything and everything you've ever wanted to know about Facebook advertising, and you can teach yourself how to take advantage of this. Um, now, when I do talk about Facebook ads, I did want to call out, I'm talking about using Facebook Ads Manager. I'm not talking about the boost button on your Facebook page, and I really don't recommend that people use the boost button. Um, your targeting is really limited on that, and it's, you're kind of just going to pick some generic targeting, so certain age range certain geographic area, and then a few interest-based targetings, and that's it. Don't recommend that. I definitely recommend getting a little bit more detailed and some custom audiences, which is what I'm about to dive into. Um, to use Ads Manager, you do need a business manager. If you don't have a business manager, free to create, easy to create, you go to business.facebook.com. And again, if you're not familiar with Business Manager, don't panic. Facebook Blueprint, really great free resource to teach you anything and everything you've ever wanted to know about getting that set up. So let's assume that you're familiar with this and that you have your Facebook business manager set up and you use ads manager already. Um, if that's you, great. If not, again, that's okay. <laughs> Check out Facebook Blueprint. You can, you can teach yourself. Um, that's how I learned back in the day. Um, and even when they roll out new things. That's usually the first place I go. Uh, when they roll out a new feature, I go to Facebook Blueprint and I figure out how to how do you do it, and I take the classes. Um, so it's a great resource. But assuming that you're already using this, I want to talk a little bit about custom audiences. Um, so this is going to go beyond just sort of your in interest-based targeting that you can do with Facebook. You can actually use your own data. So from Facebook Business Manager in your navigation, there's an audience tab. It's going to take you here. When you go to create audiences, you've got a couple different options. You've got custom audiences, which is what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. But you can also do lookalike audiences of your custom audiences. So that you're going to have a uh, audience already created, and you're going to tell Facebook, okay, I want you to go find people that look like these people. Um, and then also I do want to call out if your organization falls under the political and or national importance category, <clears throat> and you ever need to run ads, um, for things about education or housing or, you know, domestic violence, some of those things do fall under a national importance category, so you have to add an extra disclaimer. You also do have different targeting options. You're a little bit limited in some ways, so that's another place where you can build out those ads, audiences, just in case if that applies to you. But for today, we're going to talk about building some custom audiences, specifically ones that are really going to help you uh, with getting registrations for your events. So a couple different ones, uh, website traffic, 
it's not going to dive into too much, but I do want to call out. I mentioned at the beginning about Facebook Pixel. If you've had a Facebook Pixel on your website for a while, that's great because you can use that data and all that traffic to create audiences on your website. So you could say, you know, you want people that have been on your web, your registration page for your event in the past 30 days, and then you can create a lookalike audience of that to go out and find new people. So that's why Pixel is really important on the ad set, ad, the audience side. So if you've had that, definitely take advantage of that. But today what I want to talk about is customer list and then events. So customer list, this is going to be using your own donor list, so your own data. Um, so you can upload lists of your supporters, your email list, you know, past event registration uh, people. Um, you can get really creative with this. So customer list, it's a really great option. But then also if you don't have that or... Um, you know, it's just not a very big list. You've only got about 100 people, a little bit small, going to be hard to target. You can also use Facebook sources. So you can see there's a ton of different ones. But you can even do based on people who've engaged with your past events on Facebook. So here's kind of an example of what that looks like if you're going to go create a custom audience based on events. So you can target or exclude people based on their past engagement. So you could say, you know, here's kind of an example, anybody who's responded to going or interested to this event. You can also add multiple, um, you know, if you want every gala that you've had in the past, you know, year, you want to list all of those and target the people that have responded as going or interested. Um, you can also exclude people. So this is really good. If you have a new Facebook event already set up and you're trying to get new people to register for it, um, make sure you have an exclusion. So people that have already RSVP'd to your event that you're trying to promote now, exclude them so you're not wasting your money uh, retargeting people that are already interested and said that they're going to go. Um, so you can get really, really creative with this. There's a lot of different ways to slice and dice. You can change the amount of days. You can um, actually change, you know, only people who've responded as going, um, et cetera. Kind of a good place though if, if you have this data already you can take advantage of it so that would be if you're going to do a custom event based on past event interactions another option this is a really popular option and one that i see a lot of nonprofits not taking advantage of is using your donor list so when you go <clears throat> to set this up this is what you're going to see it's going to list out all the different identifiers that you can match on facebook um, you need at least one main identifier. So usually it's going to be email, but it could also be phone number, first name, last name, uh, mobile advertiser ID, if they have a Facebook app user ID or Facebook page user ID. If you have any of those things, um, you need at least one, but more is always better. Uh, but you can also include other identifiers. So those are things like your city, your zip code, your date of birth, your year of birth, age, gender. Um, all of those things. Um, if you use MailChimp, you're in luck. You can actually import your list straight from MailChimp, so you don't even have to do any formatting. Um, another option is you can upload CSV files or TXT files. Um, if you need a template for uploading your list, um, when you're in this section, you'll see that right down at the bottom, there's a download list template, and they also do have some information about formatting guidelines. If you've never done it before, when you go through that process, you can get more information about it. Another thing I do want to call out, if you have it, you can assign customer value to your list. So those would be things like the lifetime value of a donor. Um, so if you know how many times a year they usually donate to you and how much they've donated, assign that value. Um, that's really, really helpful for creating lookalike audiences in the future, a little bit more advanced. If you don't have that information, that's okay. You can check no, no big deal. The sky won't fall. <laughs> Uh, but it's just, if you have it, definitely include the value because that can be really helpful down the line. Um, whenever you go to upload that list, and, and this goes for any audience that you're creating, um, but I'm calling it out here, definitely try to make sure you're naming your audience something really specific that you're going to remember. You're limited to 50 characters, but even me, I, you know, I do this all day, every day for the past decade. I've been in the social media marketing space, um, there's still times where I'll, I'll think that like, oh yeah, I'm totally gonna remember what that audience is. And then when I'm in ad manager actually building the ad, I realize that it's too vague. So try to make sure you're really, really specific about, you know, event 2020, um, full list from, you know, this date range. So that way when you're going through, you know what the heck you're pulling. 
<clears throat> once you have your custom audiences or your lookalike audiences set up and you go to build out your ad campaign, um, there's a lot of different options for campaign objectives. If you have never done ads manager before, this is probably really overwhelming and I'm sorry, but again, I encourage you to take those free Facebook Blueprint classes, or you can feel free to call me and she can do it for you. Um, but if you are familiar with this, this is great. I did want to call it a few different campaign types that might be really helpful specifically for trying to get people to register for your event. So the first one's going to be an engagement objective. You can do a couple different engagement types. You can do post engagements. So this would be how you could replace the boost button on your page if you're used to tossing a couple bucks on each post. I would do it in an ads manager um, as a post engagement campaign objective because then you can use all of those really great custom audiences. Um, you have a little, you have more options as well when you're going and you're creating the ads. Um, but another post engagement uh, campaign objective type that you can do is event response. So if you want to get RSVPs on your Facebook event, that's another way to go after that. So that would be one option. Um, another option would be maybe you're trying to drive people to your website to register for your event, especially if it's a paid event. Um, so you can do ads with traffic driving straight to your website uh, landing page, or even better, conversions. If you have your Facebook pixel set up on your website to be tracking specific conversions, like uh, you know, ad payment info when they start to register or once they have registered for an event. Um, you can, instead of doing traffic, you can optimize for conversions. So Facebook's going to try to serve those ads more to people who are most likely <clears throat> to actually complete the registration after seeing an ad. So two different options there. The conversions, you do need to have the Facebook pixel in place with conversion tracking set up. Um, if you don't, just doing a traffic uh, campaign objective will also work for you. So again, Facebook Blueprint is free. So if I just overwhelmed you and you're going, I have no idea what you're talking about, Erica, you're speaking Greek, uh, go to facebookblueprint.com backslash student backslash catalog. Literally, Facebook has free classes on all of this. Um, you don't need to go pay a ton of money to listen to somebody else's webinar telling you how to do these things. Facebook already has really great online courses ready to go for you. Um, any questions? On that, before I keep moving forward, Clay, I know we're hitting the end. We've got questions and a few housekeeping, and that's it. So we'll open it up. Okay. Did I leave you? I'm talking to myself again. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, yes, there was one earlier about Instagram and oh. it's, um, so w what do you do on Instagram to get people on your event registration page since you can't include clickable URLs on your IG captions? Yeah, so that's tough. Unfortunately with Instagram, you still can't click a URL in the caption. So some more grounds for that. Um, I did mention with Instagram stories, if you have at least 10,000 followers, you can do the swipe up Instagram story option, which is nice. Um, but the other real workaround would be to have a really clear link in bio. So changing your URL and your Instagram profile to be your registration page for the event. Or if you want to take it a step further, there's a lot of free tools like uh, Like to Know It or Linktree. Linktree is free. That's a really good one. Linktree is a URL that you can stick in your Instagram profile and it creates like a mini mobile landing page. So when people click on it, it'll open up to different tabs that you can create. So you could have a tab that says, you know, register for our October 23rd event. Um, and then you could also have a tab that says, you know, donate now, um, you know, visit our blog, you know, whatever kind of actions people might normally be taking from that link in bio. Um, the benefit of that is that way when you're doing your Instagram caption, instead of trying to include some big clunky URL that no one's going to click because they can't and they probably won't remember to go back and type into their computer later, um, you could just do hashtag link in bio and that tells people, okay, if I'm interested in this, I need to go to the profile, click that link, and I can get the information. So that'd be kind of a workaround for you um, if you're working through that. Hopefully that answered the question. And any others, Clay? Yeah, there's a few about audiences. 
which sure uh, the first one is when you're setting up ads can you combine audiences yeah absolutely so when you're going in on ads manager and you're actually starting to build out the ads so this is going to be sort of your first step where you're choosing your campaign objective when you go to the next screen um, in Ads Manager, it's going to give you a section where you can build audiences. So you can pull from saved ones or you can create new ones. If you wanted to combine and say that you had maybe a donor list that you uploaded and a event registration list from your past events and you want to target both of those people with the same ads, you could just create an audience type that has the, both of those lists in them. You can also narrow it down further. If you want to narrow it down by age range, um, geolocation, you can also put interest parameters, either including or excluding them. Um, you can get really, really targeted and fancy <laughs> with your audiences, and, okay. and a lot of that's just test and learn. Okay, and then here's another one. So sure. can you use audiences to exclude people from seeing your ad? Like if you're doing a and had to get registrations can you exclude people that are already registered if you have them in an audience yeah absolutely so probably the easiest way to do that would be to kind of go back here if you're doing the uh using your donor list you could upload your list of people that have already registered and then when you're creating that ad audience there is an exclude option so you could just say you know here's all my parameters but i do want to exclude anybody who's on this list already or another option like with this one, if you're using your past event data, um, you've got, you know, we're excluding people that have already RSVP'd to this one current event because we're trying to reach new people. Okay. And then um, the next one is a little simpler. So why, why do they even need to create campaign objectives? What do those do for them? Uh, so this would be if you're doing advertising. So if you're going to do Facebook advertising to reach new people um, or even just retarget your followers that may or may not be seeing your content in your feed and you want to make sure they do, um, Facebook is going to force you to choose a campaign objective because Facebook wants to optimize your ad based on the result that you're looking for. So for example, you know, if you're focused on reach and you just want to reach as many people as possible, whether they're interested or not, you could do kind of this awareness category. Um, so Facebook is going to optimize your ad to reach as many people as possible. Whereas kind of on this other end of these conversions, if you want someone to register for your event and that's really what you're tracking, um, Facebook is going to probably limit who it's targeting based on your audience a little bit. And they're going to target people that have shown behavior in the past to indicate that they would be likely to complete that transaction and, and convert for you. Um, you know, same thing, if you're trying to get people to respond to your Facebook event, you're going to want to use that engagement campaign type and you want to do the engagement type of event response because that's going to optimize your ads for people RSVPing to your event. Um, so so that's you definitely hard. have to <laughs> that sounds like Facebook is, so you're picking an audience, it's not just randomly sending stuff to that audience, it's going to tailor, like the AI tailors, who gets messaging based on which goal you selected, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. All right, cool. Yeah. Uh, and then it's also going to change what that ad looks like, too. When you're going into the creative side of it and building the ad, you're going to have different features um, of how that's going to display and what your call to action buttons are. Based on what your goal is. Yep. Okay. Yep. Or so for example, like in a, yeah, so like your event response engagement objective, um, the action call to action button on that is going to be an RSVP button on the Facebook event. So it'll default to interested or going um, and people can just click that button to save it. So if that's gonna be really different than, you know, maybe a conversion ad that has a call to action button that you choose that says sign up or register now that they click and it's driving them to a landing page that you have set up. Okay. And then uh, another question on uh, which is about retargeting. So can you retarget people with Facebook ads? Or I guess yeah, it's better to ask what types of activities can you retarget? 
Yeah, absolutely. So you definitely can retarget. <clears throat> um, a lot of different ways you can do that. Um, so kind of going back here, I pulled out, you know, your custom audiences. These are all of the different sources that you can pull. So you can retarget people that have watched one of your recent videos to 100% completion. You can target people, retarget people that like your Facebook page or have engaged with your Instagram account or have, you know, RSVP to an event in the past. Um, you can also retarget based on website activity. Um, if you are a Facebook or Instagram user and you get ads for things, um, you know, maybe you were on, you know, Disney website not that long ago and now all of a sudden you're getting these ads about the Florida resident special, you're probably getting retargeted because you're on their website. Um, so you could have it set up where, you know, anybody who's been on your web, the register your event section of your website in the past 30 days, you want to retarget them with ads. Um, but you can also take that a step further too, and you can exclude that list of people that have already registered. <clears throat> so there's a million different ways that you can slice and dice this. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, you can definitely retarget. Okay, cool. Uh, any other questions from folks out there? Feel free to chat me if you want. I think um, everyone's admit, already an expert. <laughs> um, did want to call out that this Thursday, we've got a really great fundraising panel uh, coming up. I will be there. Meredith, our talented creative director at Achieve, will be there. We've got Ann Carolyn from Great Charity Challenge. She's going to moderate for us. And then we have uh, some of the lovely ladies from the Dream Team team you may or may not have heard from in the past few weeks. It's going to be a little more informal. You know, it's not like a webinar where we've got all these slides and you're listening to us drone on, we're gonna have um, you know some questions and, and a conversation around fall campaigns and virtual events. And then we will be answering all of your questions as well. So feel free to join us if you wanna talk to some more of these ladies. And as always, feel free to ask questions to me directly, um, whether you're embarrassed to chat now or you just don't think of it until you're reviewing the slides later feel free to shoot me an email at any time erica at achievecauses.com i'm here for you guys and i'm happy to help okay uh yeah and just a reminder everyone the session is being recorded and that'll be available on the website uh around the end of the week um and i realize there's a lot of material in here and um erica talks a little fast but uh <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, there is, uh, there's just a lot uh, behind Facebook Business Manager and all the things you can do. So this is really set up to give you a little introduction to the power there and help you understand why you really do need to learn more about it. It's an extremely powerful tool and a great way to reach people that maybe you don't talk to normally. Yep, absolutely. And, and, and then one I more do... question that came in real quick. Yeah, I saw it too. Go for it. <laughs> uh, all right. Is there a way to go live and have it be private to paid registrants? Yes. So there's a couple of different ways to approach that. Um, you know, certainly if you're using Zoom or something, you can limit, uh, you know, who, who gets the link and have some of that password protected. If you're hosting a virtual event on, you know, kind of a landing page or your website that you've built out, you can password protect that website. Um, also, if you're using that Facebook feature uh, where they have to pay for access, if you're eligible for that, that's kind of another option. There's a lot of different ways to, to uh, limit access in that regard. It kind of just depends on what platforms you're planning on using. Yeah, and there is uh, like on Zoom, for example, like you're on a Zoom webinar now, there is an option in Zoom webinar that requires people to enter a code to join the webinar. So we didn't do that on this webinar because we want it to be easy for folks, but that way even if someone shared the link or if you just had the link on your website to make it easy for people to find it, but sent them that code in an email or a, a, a chat or something like that, a text message, then that's another way to kind of protect who can get into the meeting. Um, so a couple of options there and pretty much all the platforms, whether it's Zoom or go to meeting, go to webinar or uh, gosh, any, any one of the four or five other ones out there, they all have similar features like that to make things private. So if there aren't any other questions, we will sign off and 
make sure that everyone gets, uh, they'll get an email with Erica's slide deck, and you'll find URLs and things in her slide deck. And then uh, we'll send out a uh, email at the end of the week when all the webinar recordings are available on the website. So thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, Erica, for putting on this great presentation. And we Thank hope to you. see everyone on Thursday.